Once, there was a beautiful country. It was ruled by a great and just king. But there was one strange thing about this country. Roses had been forbidden to even talk about. And for as long as anyone could remember. The king had one son who, much to the concern of his father, was blind as a bat. Every possible cure was tried. Herbs were collected from near and far, and magic words uttered in loud cries and tiny whispers. However different the attempted cures, the result remained the same. The young prince was blind, and he stayed blind. Eventually, the king decided to take a different approach. He told himself that that which you cannot change, you should learn to accept and make the best of. And so it came about that on his 12th birthday, the blind boy was presented with his new private teacher. He was a tiny, very, very old and even wiser man, for he had traveled much and traveled far. And he had eyes that spoke of all the things that they had seen. Eyes that knew who people really are. They say that he could whisper to the stars and they That he could ride the tempest on the winds. The rumor went that he had drunk the water of eternity. The devils and the wizards were his friends. This old man had entered the life of the young prince 
with one sole purpose. He was to teach the young boy how to use his four remaining senses to an extent that they would almost replace his lack of sight. He was, in other words, to make out of a blind prince a worthy king. And so, from this day forward, and for many years that came, the prince would be busy all day long, learning about the world around him through hearing, tasting, smelling and touching. One of the first things the teacher told his new student was the following. I will teach you almost everything I know myself. And so you will become very wise. But you should know that when we brag about our wisdom, it is a sign of a fearful and uncertain soul seeking approval. And the sweet fulfillment that can come from being flattered and adored by others will confuse our sense of judgment, will distort what our senses are trying to tell us. Bragging is no good. And yet, we have an obligation to be who we are in this world. It is indeed a delicate balance. You will see. Teaching a blind boy to be a worthy king, that is quite a task. Some might even say that it is impossible But the wise man was not only wise, he was also a wonderful teacher. He seemed to know the very soul of the prince. And the prince on his side was forever inspired and eager to learn. And so he learned and he learned and he learned. <laughs>
in the end, by the age of 18, the prince possessed every ability and virtue necessary for a knight and a king, apart from one. Sometime the prince had felt like something was missing. I cannot tell you why or how he felt this. We must just remember that the prince had become an extremely sensitive young man. Maybe certain words had been replaced in books, or the winds would carry strange smells. One day he could not bear it any longer and shared this feeling with his teacher. The wise man said, It seems to me that your education has reached its completion. By now you sense not only everything that's there, but also that which is not there. This means that I will have to tell you that which I cannot say. And then they walked to the most desolate parts of the royal garden and sat down on the grass among the trees where they could be sure not to be seen or overheard. I have traveled a lot, began the old man, and I have seen even more. But never have I been as touched as when I was in the remote parts of a country 
far away from yours. For never have I seen anything as beautiful as what I saw that day. It was a flower desire to know everything about this strange flower. What may the name be of such beauty, he asked, and how come that I have never caught the scent of it among the many exotic flowers in the royal gardens? My dear prince, said the wise man, this flower is forbidden in your country forbidden by law, and the law sealed by magic. If I would as much as whisper its name in my sleep, walls would turn thin like paper, winds would carry the word, and the king would know that his law had been broken, and by whom. I am afraid that not even my life would be spared. The 
blind prince had learned the truth. And he felt his heart and soul turning away from his father and the whole kingdom. And what had once been great and just now seemed to him empty and false. The only thing he wanted in the world was to find the forbidden flower. And all night long he tossed and he turned in his bed and did not find his sleep while strange voices spoke and argued inside his troubled mind. You thought it was a perfect scheme Where good was good and evil evil But you were in a foolish dream And one that was too blue by to be true Did you think your papa was an angel with angel wings to make him fly? Then wake up and smell the coffee. You have been living on a lie. Don't you know that no one can be perfect? Perfection is the fruit of an idea. It's a part of growing older To face the facts and to come here So life is not a fairy tale Where good is good and evil evil Snap out of childhood's past and stay Your vision was too good But now you don't know where to turn You don't know what to do Now you don't know where to turn And you don't know what to do But it's only natural You should lose your bearings when When morning came, the prince had made his decision. He went to his father and spoke the words of all fairy tale princes. He said, Father, 
I will go out into the world to find my luck. And although it caused the king pain, knowing how dangerous a journey like this would be for his blind son, he was still a fairy tale king. And therefore he gave his accept. Not long after this came the day when the prince, packed and ready to go, said goodbye to his father, the king, and to his teacher, the wise man, mounted his horse and rode out of the gates of the castle and into his journey of the unknown. He was equipped with the finest horse in the kingdom. Food and drink for many days in his saddlebags. And gold and silver coins for when that would run out. Not to mention his four senses sharpened and refined to perfection. Finally, time had come for the blind prince to experience the adventures that he had so far only heard and read about. He felt the sun on his face, listened to the sounds of the world, deciphering their sources. He let his nose tell him of humidity, vegetation and the people around him. And he met many, the traveling folk, young and old, tradesmen, gypsies, adventurers, whole families of immigrants on their way to a better life. He would join and travel along, listening to their stories, taking their advice on how to travel and how not to travel. He loved them all, and he loved that he was now one of them. First, he would openly tell his own story, though he always kept the part about the flower to himself. He noticed, however, that his wayfaring friends were mostly not as good listeners as they were storytellers. They would soon interrupt, reminded of something they had heard or experienced themselves. Sometimes a skeptical silence would follow his story, or he caught the scent of envy and disbelief from his traveling companions. For a long time, the prince withstood the temptation of drawing proof to the truthfulness of his own words. And he became more careful with what he would tell people. He felt then strangely unappreciated and a little less certain of himself. You are an awkward child You will mold your world from the unknown Breaking some conventions You Thank you.
You don't know the world You don't know the fears you've passed Stranger to yourself You don't know yourself Stranger to the One day, he met a young man who was refreshingly different from the other traveling folk. He carried with him only a big sea eagle inside a bird's cage. And he was a great listener. This young man cheered up the blind prince by asking him all sorts of questions. And he inspired the prince to draw out from his saddlebags what he had to prove his royal inheritance. The stranger was both amazed and amused. And the bird in the cage joined in with loud shrieks of appreciation. What a change of traveling companions. What's the story of your bird? the prince asked. For he was curious to know. Well, I won it a couple of days ago on a market, replied the young man. Playing cards with a very, very old man who claimed it was really an enchanted princess. And she could only be saved by a man who'd seen himself. I didn't believe a word he said, he added. And they didn't talk of the bird anymore. When evening came, they camped by the side of the road. Until late at night, the prince had to tell his amazing stories over and over again about all the things he had learned from the wise man. In the end, they fell asleep, close to the glows of the dying fire. But when the blind prince woke up in the morning, looking forward to yet another day in the company of his new friends, he found that the young man was gone. And so was the royal horse and everything else the prince had owned. The only thing his companion had had the heart to leave behind was the bird in the cage, now screaming from discontent. A beautiful wild bird like you should not be inside a cage, said the prince. And he opened the door to the cage. And the bird jumped out onto his shoulder and did not fly away. So, you want to stay with me, do you? But I have nothing to give you. All that was once mine has been taken away. How do you expect a poor blind prince to take care of you if he does not even know how he will feed himself? And he brushed the bird off his shoulder and walked on down the road without looking back. Yes, he carried on by foot, determined not to give up his search for the flower. And he 
began to invent stories about himself. Who would believe that he was a prince now, anyway? When people asked him who he was and where he was going to, he would one day be an orphan searching his parents, the next a writer traveling to learn about the world, anything that came into his mind. He found much pleasure in these games. He found that he could easily become someone else and he always managed to fool his traveling companion completely. There's nothing in the world like putting up a show With every other day you start anew with being someone you don't know Today, a young heroic soldier just returned from wars far away Cracking nasty jokes with head held high Tomorrow with a lowered shoulder, once a famous actor Now gone astray Quoting Shakespeare with convincing Shakespeare's actor side And then you'll be a lover full of fire and of heart Returning to your loved one to fulfill your best of heart a simple crook, an orphan in distress, a servant boy, a gypsy champion of chess. You do them all with pleasure, for there's nothing in the world like putting up a show. With every other day you start a new with being someone you don't know. <laughs> and that's how you become the king, and people are your fools, where you can change your accent, change your story. Change the rules! There's nothing in the world like putting up a show With every other day you stop a new piece of a you don't know <laughs> And that's how you become the king And people are your fools When you can change your accent Så er det så sådan, at vi skal forlade den blinde prins et øjeblik for at tage en kort pause. Jeg vil gerne sige tusind tak, fordi I alle sammen er kommet. Tusind tak. Det er Rune Kågaard på klaver og alt muligt andet. Mathieu Kalesje og Thomas Goubain deler på yndigste vis denne her trumme verden. Og på fantastisk violin fra Serbien, Manja Ristik. One day, he stepped into an inn and sat at a wooden table in the back of the room. Every once in a while, he took care to heave a deep sigh of discontent as he continuously shook his head before burying it in his hands. He had not eaten for days and he hoped that a convincing act would buy him food and compassion from some gullible passerby. And sure enough, it did not take long before someone approached him. What brings thou in this state of despair, young beggar? He heard a voice say, close to his right ear. 
I am not a beggar. Were it only so, I am a wealthy tradesman, a traveller of precious stones, who has just been viciously attacked and robbed of everything within the wilderness of these damn surrounding forests. Hence my despair. And now you want me to buy you a meal today. And then tomorrow you will cover me with your precious stones. The prince felt a little dizzy. He didn't know if it was the hunger or the strange voice in his ear. And he said, very apt, my good fellow, very apt. Yes, indeed, something along those lines. Would you have the goodness? Now the voice came very close. Yes, I would certainly have the goodness. But I fear I do not have the faith. for he was very hungry. I put all my faith in you. These words seemed to satisfy the stranger, who then went away and left the hungry tradesman to his own thoughts. and left him there for a long time and left him there till in the end the prince got up with the annoying realization that he had been fooled 
as he stepped out of the inn and onto the dirty street to continue his journey, it occurred to him that not only had he been fooled, he had lost his faith too. Yes, listen up. Let's make a deal. You will get your precious meal. Borrow me your faith and I'm your friend. Ah, be a friend if you borrow me your faith. Just borrow me your faith. I'm your friend. Some time later, he heard a woman sitting by a river at the edge of a forest, crying like she would never stop. The prince followed the sound to ask her, why are you crying? He heard the distinct sound of a salty teardrop hitting sweet river water as the woman sighed and in a tiny broken voice began to sing.
so terrible about that? Asked the prince. I am an orphan, and though I have no parents to take care of me, I don't worry about what will happen tomorrow. I know I will find my parents one day. You see, said the woman, you have all this hope, and I have none. If I could only borrow your hope for just one day, then all my trouble would disappear. At this point, we could have hoped that the prince would have benefited from the wisdom of his experience. But as we all know, men cannot stand women crying. And so he said, I will be happy to help you, and immediately gave her his hope. In return, the woman stopped crying and said in a completely different tone of voice, Let's meet here tomorrow, same time, and I will give you back your hope. The prince agreed, and the woman disappeared into the forest. day to retrieve his hope. He found the woman almost screaming from sadness by the river. What has happened? he asked. She could hardly answer from renewed sorrow. But soon the prince came to understand that this poor woman had lost his hope somewhere in the woods. She had searched for it all night, but had not found it. And now, she didn't know what was to become of her. She wished that she had never met him and that she had, he had never borrowed her his hope. For now, when she knew what it felt like and yet was without it, it made her feel much worse than before. Go away, she said to the prince. There's nothing you can do for me. The blind prince left the woman by the river and carried on down the road with a horrible feeling inside. He had lost all hope and he'd never felt so blind in his entire life. In one of the many countries the prince traveled through, he heard the rumors that the princess in the castle of ice was in terrible trouble and that she needed help from a real prince. Although he had lost his hope and had given away his faith, 
These rumors made him curious. So he went to the castle of ice, pretending to be a prince, but a different prince than himself. And the servants, who all wore big fur coats, immediately let him in, gave him a fur coat to match their own, and took him to the big hall where the princess was sitting on her throne. Wearing a coat like mine to keep you warm? asked the prince, who was a different prince than himself. No, that would be useless. The cold is coming from me. I need a real prince to help me. But no prince wants to even visit a princess who is made of ice. They all hurry back to other countries and warmer princesses. And soon I will die from my own cold. My face is turning blue now. And just this morning, my first toe broke off. This princess was definitely in a terrible situation, the prince thought. But somehow he did not feel encouraged to help her. If he had been disturbed by the, by the stream of tears that never stopped flowing from the woman who had lost his hope, he felt now an even bigger unease meeting this princess who had every reason to cry and yet didn't. At this point, he felt the ice-cold look of the princess penetrating him to his very bone. But who are you? The prince then began to tell her the story of the prince that was not himself. But although he had worked out a marvelous tale for his character, the words now seemed to fall from his mouth like dead leaves and soon dried out. In the silence that followed, he felt the uncomfortable look of the princess once more. I see right through you, and I see that you are a miserable imposter. You are not whom you claim to be. And yet you are a prince. Strange, but useful. The ice princess for nothing. Hang around, let me show you why. Come, with other souls that beg for mercy in this palace, and I don't deny. Sterling from the horror of the torture, I was always eager to supply.
Ever since I was a little baby It was clear I didn't have a heart You could ask yourself if there were maybe No one dared to love me from the start So bring your children to me, let me whisper Just a little something in their ears Since I never had my share of crying Let me have the pleasure of their tears situation but as I said you can be useful to me despite your miserable appearance and your boring lies you are a prince and therefore we will make a deal I will let you go unharmed if you give me your love Do 
though the prince had never felt his love more insignificant, he said, It seems that I have no other choice but to grant you your wish. And with these words, he stepped up onto the throne of ice that carried the princess and took her in his arms. And now strange things started happening. The princess screamed like a wounded animal. I am melting! But the prince, so ridden by frost that he fell almost unconscious, couldn't move. The screaming went smaller and smaller and less and less terrifying as he unwillingly kept holding on to this human block of ice that was quickly disappearing in his arms. In the end, it was all gone. The castle of ice, the princess, the servants, even his coat of fur. And the only thing that kept reminding him throughout the rest of his journey that all this had ever happened was the constant frost he felt inside his heart. The prince decided from then on to travel only on his own and not to speak to anyone about himself anymore. By this time, some years had passed. The prince had traveled through many countries on his search for the forbidden flower and had not found it. He was now a grown-up man, a blind man who had been led and misled by the people around him. A beggar depending on the presence and mercy of nature and man. It was around this time that he reached the desert. He smelled the sand, the heat, and the danger. And yet, he couldn't turn around and go back. Maybe it was stubbornness that made him take the first steps. Plain foolishness, or something else. Whatever it was, it made the prince walk straight out into the desert, and he didn't stop. A day the sun would burn his face and drain his body of liquid, and at night the cold desert air would sweep through what he felt like his very bones, but he kept on walking. The refinedness of his senses was no use to him here. One by one, he shut them off. Or was it the thirst and the hunger that threw themselves upon him like greedy monsters and made him senseless? Thank you.
the tongue, the quest for the need, the fear. The sound of the sand is in your soul. But still, you stumble on to lose your. Dust of time will bury you. Till one day you might rise and be desert flower. Who can tell? From your human shell, everything will dry out here. All the time, all the quest, and the need—the dust of time will blow. In the end, he had no idea where he was going or why. Below him, his feet just seemed to perform their silly, irrational movements, step by step carrying him further into nothingness. Step by step carrying him further into nothingness. Step by step carrying him. Further into nothingness, step by step, by step, by step. And one day, the blind prince stepped right out into the ocean of the world. The cool water came as a complete surprise to him. And he gave a startled cry, and dropped on the beach from exhaustion. He lay there still for a long time, thinking no thoughts, dreaming no dreams. The water washing over his feet. You travel so far to find. You lost all your senses. You've gone out of your mind. Alone on the beach, like a dead man. With every mile you traveled, didn't you leave it further behind, or could you be closer now than ever? Senses, you've gone out of your mind, alone on the beach like a dead man. 
with every mile you travel Didn't you leave it further behind Or could you be closer now than ever He had given up the blind prince. And for a while, the world was still with him, holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. A lonely bird could be seen hovering in the sky. A giant bird circling high above the lifeless prince in the sand. It was a sea eagle and its all-seeing eyes were literally fixed upon the blind prince. It began to circle lower. Approaching the lifeless shape in the sand with a series of short, sharp cries. Gradually, the sounds began to make their way to the blind prince. They were pulling him. They were dragging him. They were demanding his presence. And finally, he sat up to mumble the first word that came to him. It was the word Help. And it poured into his being like a life-giving drop of water, filling him with something he had long been without. It was the feeling of hope. Help! He cried again at the top of his voice. He waited to listen. I will help you, blind prince, if you get up and tell me what it is that you want. The blind prince got up from the sand. If the cries from the sky had awoken him from unconsciousness, then this simple question managed to put him back into his own story. And he began to remember things that had long been forgotten. A line from an old song that the wise man had sung for him only once, many years ago, popped up in his head. Uh, I'm 
looking for a flower, he said. And before he knew it, he was singing the whole song, addressing it to the sky and the voice above him. It was a flower a beautiful song and have you found what you have sought no said the prince I have been everywhere in the world but I have not found the flower you might have traveled the whole world over three times and have met the most likely and unlikely people in it there is still one place you have not searched. You must look inside yourself. The prince was puzzled. I am blind, he said. If I cannot see uh, outside of myself, then how will I ever be able to look within? I cannot tell you, said the voice. But have you ever tried? No, the prince had never tried. But here at the end of the world, that was exactly what he decided to do. There will be nothing, he thought as he, in the darkness of his lack of sight, imagined that he was turning his look inwards. And he was more afraid of this than he had ever been of anything. Mm -hmm. 
While trying, the prince forgot the world around him. There was only him inside the darkness. He felt his breath, the beats of his heart. He sensed the rushing of the blood in his veins. And truly enough, at first there was only darkness. Forget yourself, said the voice. And he forgot himself. He became as big as the universe and as small as nothing at all. And then things started happening. Colors appeared. Blue, red, green, purple, orange, floating around among each other, mixing, swirling, disappearing, mixing, swirling, disappearing. And as he opened his heart to whatever would happen, he lost his fear and the colors began coming together. Falling in place. Forming a shape that touched him like nothing had ever touched him before. It was a flower. Its crown leaves red as blood embracing each other in a velvety softness. It was a creation of such immense and tender beauty. And yet its stem was scattered with thorns sharp like the sword of a soldier. The blind prince knew that this was the flower he had been looking for. Not only during these years of traveling, but his whole life. The tale of the flower was the tale of himself. And he was overwhelmed by a myriad of feelings. He felt his long-lost friends, faith and love, returning to him. And he began crying. Or was it drops of dew that fell from the flower inside him? made their way through his eyes and down his cheeks like tears. It was all becoming one and making no sense at all. And exactly at the same time, making all the sense And then the blind prince opened his eyes and he could see. Before him, stretched out, blinking and secretive, lay the ocean of the world. And behind him, as far as the eye could see, the ruthless and bare desert. He took in the colors and the shapes of the world for the first time in his life, and he loved it all.
You've had a sign from the bird in the sky. Somebody spoke in your dream. What you have felt was always true. A scheme. Everything that went before took you to this place. Everything that comes hereafter written in your face. You are the charm. you let out of the cage of the thief, she said, in her mild human voice. You sent me away thinking that you had nothing left to give me. But sometimes we must lose everything before we are able to receive. And then she put out her hand to take the hand of the prince. And it was right there, between the desert and the ocean of the world, that they fell into each other's arms. The sky parted, and down fell a thousand roses, and out of the very thin air the most beautiful song was heard. It was almost like in a fairy tale. And it was in a fairy tale. It was in a fairy tale of the forbidden flower. And it was in the end of the fairy tale of the forbidden rose.
which was now no longer forbidden.